Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hey, hello, and welcome to Stand Energy Man on Friday. Thank goodness it's Friday. It was, this week seemed like it was never going to end for me. I won't get into any more details than that, but it was a tough week for me. Anyway, uh, also ending up pretty recently is the legislature, which is kind of wrapping up its uh, season right now. And so uh, I've asked several legislators to come on and, and talk to us about energy bills and things in the legislature. And the first one to pop up was uh, Senator Gil Rivera from the North Shore. And uh, you know, I got to say that the, the legislature is full of all kind of great, great folks. And um, but I'm really impressed with the ones that reach out to the energy office and to my office and the university and ask questions about energy things because then I know they're really engaged in the topic and they really care about what's going on in their community and helping their constituents. So, yo, thanks for being on with us. Appreciate it. Appreciate thanks, you Dan. Coming on. Thank you for and, inviting me. No, my pleasure. And. Uh, Thanks for reaching out to us. We we obviously, you know, want to give you the best information that we can for you to help make good decisions for the state. So, yeah, yeah thanks for being engaged. That's great. I was hooked on, um, you know, we met because of the, the question of hydrogen. I was hooked on the product uh, several years ago when I got to tour the Pearl Harbor Hickam mm. and drive a hydrogen fuel cell car back in 2011 or 12, right. maybe. Right. And I thought, wow, that's a product that we need to talk about going forward. So as I've been involved in the legislature, you know, I've asked you about that a few mm -hmm. times, and, and I'm always interested in uh, alternative energies that are going to be useful and practical for us. Well, we're still pushing on the hydrogen button, and we're hoping that we'll get that, that moving along pretty quick. And it, things have been happening. It's, it's a quiet, kind of the old George R. Rio, she quiet but mm -hmm. effective uh, story, where there's a lot going on in the background, a lot going on internationally. Um, uh, we're pretty much aware of South Korea and Japan and China pushing into fuel cells in, in a really big way. I just found out this morning that Vietnam is very interested in hydrogen fuel cell technology and, and extending that way too. So there's a lot of going on in Asia, a lot going on in Europe, a lot going on in California, some stuff going on on the east coast of the U.S. And of course here in Hawaii, uh, the University of Hawaii, our office, Blue Planet Research, we're all, we're all really heavily engaged in hydrogen. So. We'll keep, keep you informed. Yeah, that's great. I'm looking forward to that day. Mm. Well, what's some of the things that have been going on in the legislature in terms of uh, bills that you know got through? And I, I know they don't hit all ears, but let's start off maybe with the process. Okay. Um, I think a lot of folks don't really understand the legislative process here in the state of Hawaii and how bills move through. If you could give us a quick 101 on that, that would probably be really helpful. Okay, quick uh, civics course. Yeah. Uh, so we've got the House and the Senate, 25 members in the Senate, 51 in the House. And um, we, when we introduce bills, sometimes a bill will be introduced um, in each chamber. It'll be the same identical bill, so it'll be called a companion. Okay. Um, for example, I work with uh, Representative Sean Quinlan in my area for some bills, and Rep. Keo Kaloli or Rep. Uh, Matsumoto, the different representatives I work with, and we may introduce matching bills. And then depending on the, the pace and the um, activity in, of the committees in either of the chambers, a bill may get some traction or it may stall out. So it's good to have those two right. sets of uh, bills to, to, to get them through, yeah. Um, so they have to pass through each house, and so they cross over. So when the Senate is done working on a bill, we have to vote on it three times, plus it has to go to committee. It's in the committees where the public gets to testify, and um, the, the testimony is actually very useful, because we'll have these lofty ideas sometimes, and we'll say, well, I think we can fix X, Y, or Z with this bill, but we don't see all the repercussions. So the experts or the people that are involved in that business, that industry, that technology, will come in and testify, help us punch it up and make it a better bill. And that's why it gets modified along the way. Right? Yes, and so sometimes it's a completely different bill by the time it comes out the other end, um, notwithstanding the, the infamous gut and replace. Uh, but there's bills sometimes where it starts to do something, and by the time it gets to the end, it, it accomplishes generally the same thing, but it may look very different. So the Senate will uh, work on it for the first month and the House simultaneously. And then the bills will pass on to the other House and they'll go through the same process. So each bill theoretically has a real uh, heavy vetting. Mm -hmm. uh, in reality, sometimes they only get one or two hearings and they go through fairly quickly. Um, but hopefully by the time it gets around to the last committees, it's in, in a form ready to roll. Um, I serve on the Ways and Means Committee, which is the Senate Money and Budgeting Committee. So anything that has to do with money 
appropriations, um, et cetera, will come through Ways and Means. So I have a chance to uh, have, a, have a broader perspective of all the bills moving through. Even if we do pass the bill, and even if the House passes the same bill, it might be slightly different. Yeah. And at that point, it goes into the uh, notorious conference committee process. And that is where good bills sometimes just die due to um, either budgetary concerns or maybe disagreements. Sometimes you get some personalities involved in the House and the Senate negotiators get mad at each other. So, oh, you're going to kill my bill? I'm killing your bill. Mm -hmm. And that's a tragedy, you know, when that happens. Yeah. So we, we hope to have the decorum and the cooperation to come up with good bills. But mm -hmm. uh, sometimes personalities get in the way. And so. if it makes it all the way through the committee, the committees and, the, and that process, it goes to the governor for signature? And it either come, becomes law with his signature or over time without his signature, or he vetoes it. And yep. if he vetoes it, what, what happens? So on a veto, um, the, the, if the legislature convenes to consider that measure again and votes by two-thirds majority in both houses, each house and both houses have to be two-thirds, then the veto is overridden. Mm -hmm. um, now, interestingly, I believe the first governor's veto override did not occur until towards the end of Governor Cayetano's wow. administration. So up until then, if the governor vetoed it, the legislature just let it lie, and maybe picked it up the next year. But since then, now, anytime we hear uh, veto, uh, my Everybody colleagues, we start talking about, we coming back, we coming back. So uh, it's an it's, uh, interesting power play between the, you know, the, gov well, the branches of government. Well, thanks for that um, quick civics lesson, because I know that a lot of us paid attention in school, but it's been a while. Yeah. And, and it's good to always look look at the process again. And I, I'd like to emphasize, too, like you said, getting down and, and submitting testimony is important. I, I've, uh, for most of my life, underestimated the interest that the, not only the state legislature or the county, um, the county councils and stuff, but also the congressional offices have in hearing from citizens. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody thinks they're too busy. They'll never listen to me. They've got other stuff to do. Um, but you'd be quite surprised if you haven't tried it already, go talk to your legislator. Um, they want to listen to you and they want to hear your input. So I would definitely I, encourage I think that. most of us do. Sometimes you'll have a legislator with a plan. They got a plan yeah. and they get out of the way. We're, we're going yeah. forward with this. And so sometimes uh, the, the public can be frustrated because they'll say, man, I gave them all these good reasons and improvements and they just wouldn't listen to it. But again, on balance, you know, we're all trying to do good right. bills and get stuff through. And we, we take the, the input and hopefully come out with a good product at the end. And, and I know, too, a lot of times I'll have a great solution for something, but I'm not seeing the finance side or I'm not seeing the social implication side or I'm not seeing the impact to people who have less income than me or more income than me and, or a business. And those things all come into play. So even though I may have a great idea and I bring it to you, you, you can go pat me on the head and say, Stan, I appreciate your input, but... We can't do that, right. and, and that's okay too, as long as it's explained and people understand they're not being ignored. They're they're just yeah. being told there's other factors at play there. And that's why it's good to go through two or three different hearings in each right. each chamber um, to get the vetting to to work on it and hear what other people are saying yeah. too. Because I guarantee you, if, if five or ten people are all saying the same thing, legislature starts listening to that. There was a bill this year, early in the year, to um, more regulate homeschooling. Homeschoolers would have to uh, pass certain check boxes and background checks and things like that. So parents would now be subject to right. this new regime. Oh, the whole homeschoolers are very organized. They came down and said, no, that's ridiculous. We're taking care of our kids. You know, you can't, that's an overreach of government. Yes. And that was an example where people power quickly <clears throat> um, turned that question around and that bill just dropped off right there. Right. So things can change if the public is, is yeah. united. So get involved, get involved to, with your yeah. legislature and your congressional delegation, especially you business folks. The congressional delegation wants to hear from you. So let's talk a little bit about energy things. Um, you're in North Shore, yep. so from Kaina Point all the way around to Kanyoi, and you work with your house uh, counterparts. Um, Jared Kehokololi has been on our show once or twice, and mm -hmm. and I think he's running for Senate now in the one on Kailua side, isn't he? Correct, yeah, for the neighboring mm -hmm. Senate district, mm -hmm. for the Kaneohe side. So, I, you know, and I talk to him a lot, too, about hydrogen. He's very interested in hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And um, so what are some of the things that, you know, and I, I, like I said earlier, I don't want to talk about specific bills necessarily, but you know, have different categories of bills like tax incentives and things like that. Yeah. Have you seen anything in those categories like tax incentives or 
or um, standing up new offices or anything that actually made it through uh, past. I mean, if it hits ways and means, it's it's practically through the gauntlet. So um, things that made it at least past your your committee that. A couple of bills that, that went through. There's a, a matching program now. We, we um, appropriated a two million dollars for the uh, HTDC high tech. Okay. You guys yep. um, to uh, to match federal uh, grants. So to to double the uh, uh, viability of, uh, of funding. So there's two million dollars this year to match programs to uh, research alternative energy okay. projects. Because a lot of times we have, again back to the great ideas but you need a proof of concept. Mm -hmm. And so that's a bill, I think, uh, it's not a giant infusion of money, but it's, it's, I'm, I know it's gonna help get some projects off the ground. Mm -hmm. We yeah. have another project, you know, the GEMS, remember yes. the GEMS project, mm -hmm. this uh, green energy right. systems, and, and a few years ago the idea was, let's, let's set aside $50 million, and we're gonna, we're gonna support uh, people who cannot afford solar. to put solar on their roof. And, and it was a great idea that was just a little bit late. Because as solar uh, penetration hits certain thresholds, um, Point Electric got a little anxious about the stability of the grid. They imposed uh, some new uh, restrictions, yeah. and suddenly the, the solar roof installation has, has tapered off, quite has a bit. dropped off yeah. a lot. So now we've got this fifty million dollars that we're paying, uh, we're borrowed, and we're paying uh -huh. money on it, and it's been sitting there for a few years without any good use. Uh, so I think this year we did something um, that's wise under the circumstances, is we've turned it now, and not just for private or uh, individual lending, but we can actually now use that money for schools, for example, um, buildings, uh, government buildings. 52% of the electricity used on this island is by uh, commercial and, mm -hmm. and government. And so now if we can use this money to help um, put solar on every school roof, mm -hmm. for example, we can save as much as you know, thirty-eight million dollars mm -hmm. is spent on electricity by the Department of Education. So that money is now getting reappropriated or now being uh, made available. Um, so it's more available for it's more available for larger users okay. to do a bigger impact on getting to renewable yeah, sources. Yeah, that that always made me wonder. Or initially, they were talking about twenty thousand dollars here and twenty-five thousand dollars there, fifteen thousand. I'm like, that's going to take a long time to get to fifty million. That's that's Correct. a pretty small bite out of that apple every day. So going to the larger uh, projects is probably a good idea. So I think I'm, so. I'm let's, that... let's support that. Okay. And then the monies that are, are saved uh, through the utilities savings, the electricity savings, can then go back in to refund uh, mm -hmm. the program. So let's, okay. let's hope this gives it a kickstart and it's not just 50 million bucks sitting doing okay. nothing. And then we had another bill, if I remember, that was talking about something going to the PUC on on a performance-based rate, um, you know, structure for the electric company. What's that one about? There's been, um, you know, the um, the utility companies get paid based on how much stuff they own and how much money they got to spend to maintain their their system. So there's been this perverse incentive where if they have a little bit of extra money at the end of the year, they go buy more trucks or something, because mm -hmm. then they have a bigger base to maintain, and therefore they need greater rates to support that. So the whole purpose of the public utilities is to provide a stable, in this case, electricity. Um, the incentives are in the wrong place. So over the last several years, the Public Utilities Commission has been working on performance-based uh, programs to, to try to unhitch that um, adverse incentive. And this year we passed a bill that will actually expedite that and then require the Public Utilities Commission to get to that day sooner where they break the cycle of uh, revenue and spending altogether, but more like stable electricity generation and more alternative renewables. And, and so I think so, that it's so gonna go in the point, right direction. At this point, is that then that just kind of directing the PUC to get the study done faster? Or, I mean, is it actually gonna um, direct the PUC to implement? Or is it more to just do the homework and and make sure we're doing the right thing? Well, the PUC is already working on certain modules of, of this bigger, um, and complicated grid and, and energy production and reliability and resiliency. Mm -hmm. um, so they're working on parts of it. This one requires them to, to get it done on a bigger, on a holistic level, and then and, and give a path forward on how are we going to break that cycle of just spending irrespective of you know our energy change. Mm -hmm. I think most people understand and most people support going to renewable energies. Um, but 
having said that, we, there's a very short fuse on this bill. This bill targets a year and a half from now for the PUC to render this report. Um, it's very uh, aggressive timeline. So I'm hoping that it's not too short, that they have to make quick answers. Mm -hmm. I hope that they, they've got enough background they information. Yeah, I hope they got enough background time, information, resources, and they can put it together in that time. Okay. Well, we're going to take a quick break here and uh, let some of the other folks talk about their shows here on Think Tech Hawaii. And we'll be back with Senator Avery uh, in a few seconds. I'm Jay Fidel, Think Tech. Think Tech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on Think Tech. Aloha. Hi, everyone. I'm Andrea Gabrielli. I'm the host for Young Talents Making Way here on FinTech Hawaii. We talk every Tuesday at 11 a.m. about things that matter to tech, matter to science, uh, to the people of Hawaii, with some extraordinary guests, the students uh, of our schools who are participating in science fair. So Young Talents Making Way every Tuesday at 11 a.m. only on FinTech Hawaii. Mahalo. Hey, welcome back to Standard Energy Man on my lunch hour as usual, because I'm a state worker, so I got to do this on my own time. But uh, we've got the state senator here watching me. He's got oversight over my lunch <laughs> hour. And uh, we've got state senator Gil Rivera. Thanks again, Gil, for yeah. being on. Hey, let's talk a little bit about your neighborhood. You know, the, you, you represent actually a, by square miles or, or acres. You, you've probably got a lot of territory in your district. Um, you went all the way from Kahuku, actually around into Kaneohe. Um, Not quite into Kaneohe Town, but to uh, Heia. Oh, Heia. Yeah. Go to okay. the fish pond is, yeah. is more or less the boundary. Um, and going the other way around to Kaena Point, Wailua and all that, Kahuku. But goes through Schofield Barracks, that's uh, almost all of Schofield Barracks, and around to Kunia Village. Okay. So we've got agriculture lands um, in Kunia, you know, the North Shore, Whitmore. We've got Kahuku, Punalu'u. We've got ag lands all the way around, conservation lands. And, and we do have a lot of alternative energy now, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's talk a little bit. About, I mean, obviously, everybody's familiar with the wind power uh, projects because they're all in your, in your area. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious as to what the folks in your district think about the wind power. And, you know, are they in favor of it? Do they kind of concerned about it? Do you have the full spectrum of some folks love it, some folks hate it? Kind of give us a, a, a picture of, of what your con, your take, take is on the wind power. When the um, the windmill the wind projects were proposed back in 2010, they're about. Um, I think our community was uh, full in full support. We said this is great. Let's get off. Let's get off of oil. And if windmills help, they provide alternative energy. It's great. Some questions were asked about the the visual effects mm -hmm. of it. And frankly, the guys selling the wind projects were not very forthright. Mm. They said things like when, when asked, hey, how's that, what are the windmills going to look like from Pupukea? And they said, oh, they're going to have a special view. Mm. And as it turns out, it's a horrendous view. And there's people that live up the top of Pupukea that can't, they, they have to close their sheet, their blinds at night because the windmills have a big red light blinking oh, yeah. in their window. Yeah. So what used to be this glorious view to Mount Ka'ala and all the, all the agricultural fields now, they got this blinking red light and windmills by day. Um, so the visual impacts have been, have been great. Mm -hmm. uh, I think once they went up, and they went up quickly, people started rethinking and say, wait a minute, what's going on there? Um, so we felt a little bit cheated on, on the visual aspects of it. Especially when you go through Waimea Bay, it's uh, it's pretty off-putting. Um, the other thing is, the, you know, they only generate the Kahuku or the um, Kualoa wind farm only generates about between 20 and 23 percent of its projected energy. So when they say 69 megawatts of capacity, they don't hit that on day in and day out. They hit about 20 to 23 percent. So there's a question as to whether it ultimately has been worth it. Mm -hmm. Um, so when they talk capacity, are they talking like 20, 30 knots of wind? Or what does it take to get a windmill to get to that capacity? Well, they, okay, now there's a, that's a, that's a better question. Um, they can start to spin at what's called a three and a half meters per second, which mm -hmm. is, I think, a 10, 11 miles an hour. Uh, the windmills can start to spin. 
Uh, however, they do their maximum damage on um, endangered species right. up until the, the wind is really blowing. So um, there are now requirements that the wind turbines uh, do not start operating until they get to five and a half meters per second. I should say to lock them up until the wind's strong. They enough. have to wait. So even though they could be spinning yeah. in, in the low, low wind um, speed, in most cases they're not allowed now because of the damage they're doing to our endangered species. Um, so they can operate up to, now they generate a certain amount of energy when they're going at full speed. Right. But once the winds drop oh, just a little bit, their, their production drops off substantially. So if the wind drops off maybe a quarter, they're only producing about an eighth that makes sense. of the, the energy. The, the wind turbines that we've used at Hickam, the folks that design them tell us that the, the, the power output is exponential. It's not a straight line. No. When you start, when you start getting into the product, uh, real productive zone, it goes up quickly. You know, every increase of a mile, uh, mile per hour or kilometer per hour just really pushes, it, uh, pushes the power output greatly. Um, but, you know, does Hawaiian Electric uh, talk about any future plans out there or that well, you're aware of? There's the um, Kualoa project, which has um, 28 or 30 windmills above Waimea. And then there's the uh, Kahuku project has another 12 right now. Okay. And there is another proposal for eight or nine, uh, even taller turbines, 656 feet, which Ooh. is 50% taller Two than the fields. buildings. 50% taller than the tallest building downtown. Yeah. Or basically, if you put one at the base of Diamond Head, it would be about the same size as Diamond Head. That's how big wow. these things are that are now proposed to surround Kahuku. Um, so the, the people in our district are very concerned. I, I guess I, I can leave it at that. Is the energy production's out there. They're killing endangered species. Um, they're a visual blight. Um, very few people think that they, they look great. So there's kind of been probably a transition from initial acceptance to a little bit more skeptical look at these things now. A lot more concern. And uh, in the Ko'olaloa area, uh, Kahuku, Haula, Laie, that area, they're very concerned um, because they're, they're worried that it, with the addition of another um, energy production, that even though it's not direct competition against solar, rooftop solar, uh, they're worried that the, 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 the grid uh, yeah. may not be able to handle um, you know, might be taken up. Well, by, it's another the, intermittent renewable, and the intermittent part of solar and wind is what destabilizes Hiko's grid. So, yeah. you know, any addition of industrial scale solar or industrial scale wind is going to mean rooftop scale solar is going to probably, you know, be pushed out of the picture. Right. Because they can control the big stuff. Right. And it's harder to control everybody's individual rooftops. So, uh, it sounds like we have some work to do with, with everybody involved to come up with some good solutions. And there's a bit of an equity question, too, and, and I've talked about this. There's a, there's a concept called uh, environmental justice. The folks in Kahuku, I think, are overwhelmingly opposed to any additional wind turbines because they've already got them, right. and now they're going to be expected to take more. And I think it's unreasonable for their position to be ignored. Yeah, I agree. And so I've been a real strong advocate to advocate mm -hmm. down, downtown here, mm -hmm. and uh, it's not right for... Um, Honolulu to tell everybody else where you know what they have to do. Well, I, I'd like to push to your constituents again. Make yourself available. Come down and do, do some testimony at the legislature. Don't let your state senator sit there and take the brunt of the of the fight by himself. You folks are the one he's fighting for. So get down there and help him out. Uh, that's that's important. The, what the people show up makes a difference, and I think people underestimate their their power. Well, that's one thing. Um... Stan, we we got a a very great community. We 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 do stand up, and you know we do protect the the North Shore and the windward side. So we're we're strong in that. But you're right. Your your point is still well taken. That we do need to um, make ourselves heard. Yeah. And um, fortunately, in the past, we have been very good at that. You know, protecting the North Shore. Well, what are some of the other good things going on in your area? Are you familiar with what's going on at Schofield with um, the military? There's and a new power fi fifty megawatt. Yeah. Um, When's that? The opening is coming up. It's pretty soon. I yeah, think. it's real soon. Yeah. And we were talking to Hiko recently, and they're excited about that project coming online. Yeah. Um, is that being pretty well accepted in the neighborhood? Uh, yeah, that one's not being <laughs> talked about too much. It's okay. it's on base. Uh, it's uh, you know it's base load, right? It's firm firm power. So that's that's pretty good. And back to one more thing on the windmills. Okay. And and solar for that matter is you have to have a base load somewhere. Yep. For when that wind, even the even when the windmill's spinning at full speed. 
you've got to have right now oil fired generators spinning in neutral, burning oil, just in case. but not making electricity, yeah. just in case. So we look at the windmill, we say, wow, that's clean, yeah. green, and wonderful, and we don't think about the, the, wind, the oil we're burning. Just to a suggestion, this comes from our microgrids at Hickam. We're looking a lot at, um, at um, flywheels, and I know HECO's got a project with, uh, with one of the local companies that's doing flywheels. That's your, absolutely your spinning reserve. Instead of running a generator, mm -hmm. whenever you have surplus electricity, you spin up that flywheel mm -hmm. and you keep it spinning. And when it's in neutral, it's got, it's got zero friction bearing. So once you get it spinning, it just keeps spinning. And then when you have that load that's unexpected, that thing kicks in really fast and takes up the load. So you don't have to run a generator in conjunction with your wind turbines to do that spinning reserve piece. And so that's, that's something that I, I would say maybe your constituents and yourself could ask Kiko to look more into is yeah. spinning reserves that, that are actually more mechanical than battery or generators. That's great. That's uh, exactly the kind of solution that we need to, yeah. to fill that load. And we need some sort of storage and because uh, um, we can generate a lot of solar power during the day. Right. Uh, we've talked about this, and I think it's really important. I think with the surplus solar, we should be making hydrogen. I agree. Um, we take uh, water, and we make oxygen and hydrogen. I mean, that's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, and then we can fire that up in our, in our cars, our fuel cell cars. We can turn the lights on. We can cook yeah. with it. We can do yeah. a lot of things with hydrogen. And not only that, but you're making oxygen. Do you have any aquaponics or, or like we do. shrimp farms yeah. and things? Yes. I mean, you, uh, I've been told by the folks that raise fish that if you— um, put oxygen into the system where the fish are rather than just air yeah. and aerate the water, but put oxygen, you actually accelerate their maturity, their growth, their growth mm. uh, pattern. So you could even take the oxygen, which we normally from our electrolyzers just throw it away. We put it in the air right. and say, great, we're cleaning up Hawaii's air. But uh, if you could actually employ it as a, as a byproduct as a product, in, in your fish farms yeah. and stuff and shrimp farms it might actually help. I always thought it was ironic when they, uh, the submarines uh, have always done this, right? So they would keep the oxygen and throw away, and throw away the hydrogen. And now here we are doing exactly the opposite. We're trying to tell the Navy to keep some of the hydrogen for from some uh, metal hydride storage instead of lithium batteries on their subs. Mm. And they're, they're starting to listen to that. Too, Good so. idea. Well, believe it or not, Senator, we're at the end of our show, and mm. I appreciate you being on. And uh, I hope that all, all of you will join us uh, next week for Stanley Energy Man. And, We'll try and get some more uh, folks from the legislature on to give us their side. But remember, you know, your voice means a lot down at the legislature, so don't hesitate to write your, your representative or your senator, and especially when it comes time for testimony. Show up down there and show the committees exactly what you think. Until next week, aloha.